fine line between the world of entertainment and the world of politics. According to a recent report by leading consultancy PricewaterhouseCoopers, the Nigeria's entertainment and media market grew by 19.3% in 2014 to reach a whopping 4 billion US dollars. Provisions made through the power of politics have significantly contributed to this massive growth in this sector, which is estimated to reach about 8.1 billion US dollars in 2019. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is Forbes Africa TV, My Worst Day. Nigerians, both in the diaspora and at home, are yearning for a radical change in terms of economic and political reforms. The new administration is getting to grips with its new position of steering Africa's largest economy in the direction of profitability and growth. But one man believes the solution is much simpler than we all think. It's all about common sense. Let's find out who will be joining us today on My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. Ben Murray Bruce, born 18th of February 1956, is a Nigerian business magnate and politician. He is the founder of the Silverbird Group, a diversified multimedia company with holdings in radio, television, real estate and cinemas. He became a member of the PDP, People's Democratic Party, and subsequently elected to the Senate of Nigeria in March 2015 representing the Bielsa East constituency in Bielsa State, Nigeria. Born in Lagos, Ben Murray Bruce attended Our Lady of Apostles, Yaba, Lagos, where he completed his primary education, and St. Gregory College, Obalende, where he obtained the West African School Certificate before he proceeded to University of South Carolina in the United States, where he received a bachelor's degree in marketing in 1979. Ben Murray Bruce describes himself as the advocator of common sense. From his early career as the Director General of NTA, Nigerian Television Authority, from 1999 to 2003, Ben Murray Bruce single-handedly revolutionized the cinema business with a startup capital of only 20,000 Naira. Ben Murray Bruce has built a billion dollar business empire, providing employment for youths all across Nigeria. You are most welcome to my worst day and it has to be asked first and foremost, who is Ben Murray Bruce? I'm just a kid who was able to become, I don't know, successful in what I chose to do by accident. That's how I describe myself. Because I didn't plan my life. When I was in university, I thought I'd get a PhD in political science. I loved political science, I loved history. Those are the things I loved. It never occurred to me I'd get into media or entertainment, or pageants and things like that. It just never occurred to me in my life. And so my whole life has been an accident. I, I didn't know I'd be a senator. I didn't know I'd be a governor or try to be one. Um, I like to refer to this as a movement, but you're a very strong advocate of the common sense movement. What do you mean by that? Can you explain to us what is the common sense movement as you refer to it? Because this? a lot of people in government, they do dumb things. I've told successive presidents of the country to appoint a minister of common sense. The minister of common sense will not have a budget. The minister of common sense, all the minister will do is think about Nigeria, and find solutions to the problems of Nigeria without thinking about enriching himself. You understand? A lot of things that are going on currently with the government, but one of the main agendas that you're actually pushing is to set up a $1 billion fund, and that's for young entrepreneurs that are looking at transforming and reforming the way in which their current situation is, and by default, affecting their surrounding communities, and so on, Yeah. Um, in the hope of actually reforming Africa. Now explain the rationale behind this. What has led to you pushing that agenda? A lot of kids, have ideas. The idea you have is your collateral. Those kids have ideas. They may not have any education, but the world is driven by ideas and patents. Those ideas need, need to be funded. And if we don't fund those ideas, then we have a problem. 
I notice whenever you're talking about the youth and their abilities and entrepreneurship, you're always talking about a small idea that can progress and be generated into something much bigger. Yeah. And when I think about your personal journey, you started your entertainment career as just a concert promoter and you've progressed to now building the Silverbird Empire as it stands today. What was that journey like for you? Did you know that you were going to go on to build one of the benchmarks of entertainment in Nigeria? My journey, my, my, you, you have to understand, I was a kid in uh, 78 or 79 and somebody knocked on my door and he was a teacher, his name is Gary Coleman, and I said, apparently, look, long story, anyway, he was a teacher for Janet Jackson, Todd Bridges and Dana Plato and all those guys. He was a teacher for kids under the age of 18 who could not go to school because they were working on TV shows. Right. So he took me to the set. So when I got there, I met Janet, I met Todd Bridges, and I met all the stars of TV shows in America at the time. And I got fascinated by the industry, Ralph Carter, Good Times, JJ, all those guys. They all became friends of mine. That is how I got into entertainment, through Louis Smallwood, who came to my house by accident, right. okay? I got into it. I loved it, but you have to understand, I don't drink and I don't smoke. So I didn't get into it because I loved the life. I got into it because it was a business. You referred back to when you were in university and said there was no plan, you just did it. And obviously by the Silverbird brand, you've actually done an exceptionally amazing job. Yeah. But no entrepreneur's path is completely easy or clear. So it leads me to ask, what has been your worst day in business? Well, I think two things happened. When Agbani won Miss World in South Africa, it was a great day. I remember, uh, it was, I, I was the director general of NT at the time, and the director of news called me. We had started showing it, and he said, we had to break for the nine o'clock news. And I said, no, let the show go on. He said, no, nine o'clock news is sacrosanct. You cannot stop. Don't forget, there are no many TV stations in Nigeria. He said, listen to me, the president is watching the news. You cannot have a beauty pageant when the news is on. I said, no, leave the pageant on. It was a live telecast. Anyway, we left it on, and Agbani won. And as soon as Agbani won, I picked up the phone, I called President Robasanjo, and he was so excited. The nation changed. But, I, but, but, but before that happened, I had to insist that we don't stop transmission so Nigeria could watch Miss World, which has never been done before, and we won. I got excited, and I went to London, and I spoke to Julia Molly, who owns the Miss World organization. I said, look, can we host Miss World in Nigeria? We negotiated, and we agreed to host Miss World here in Abuja. And I chose Abuja because I felt, you know, it's less hassle because you have 100 countries coming, you have parents of 100 girls coming, you have chaperones coming, you had 400 reporters from all over the world coming to Abuja. That was fine. A reporter from this day wrote an article, and the article said, if the Holy Prophet Muhammad was alive, he would be he would be interested in marrying one of the contestants. My Lord, once the article broke, there was a riot in Kaduna and 200 people died. Once that happened, we had a terrible, terrible, terrible backlash. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in Katsina, a young girl called Amina Lawal was gonna be stoned to death because she had a child outside wedlock through a Sharia court. When it happened, every single media organization in the West, especially those who were fighting for women's rights, Mick Jagger's wife, Bianca, all those ladies, they started writing that Miss World should boycott the pageant in Nigeria. Meanwhile, we had a hundred countries here, and it was a terrible two weeks of my life. But what was worse than that, no ambassador representing the Nigerian government spoke up in defense of Nigeria. So, I was alone and in doing interviews on BBC, Sky, Fox, every media organization in the world defending the country. And now, you're gonna do so much. Mm -hmm. The West were totally against us. Yes. And 
to cut a long story short, the girls, one day Julia Molly called me and she said she had to see me. I said, what's the problem? They said the girls were crying all night and, 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 and they, they want to leave because they felt responsible for the, for the people who died in Kaduna and so on and so forth. I did everything I could to persuade them not to leave. The American and British ambassadors were with us yes. uh, at the hotel. I went to the British ambassador and the American ambassador and I said, please tell the girls to stay. And they said, no. They said, tomorrow is Friday. After Friday prayers at the mosque across the street, if there's no riot, then you have a shot. At that time, I didn't even understand that the American and the British had better knowledge of Nigeria than I did. I didn't think about it. So I was at the Hilton Hotel with Julia Molly, with President Obasanjo's wife, Stella Obasanjo. We're looking at the window. Prior to that, I went to the Inspector General of Police, and I said to him, I said, listen, after the mosque prayers, please, if there's a riot, do not fire, do not shoot, do not use tear gas, whatever it takes, do not confront the protesters. Now, I'm a civilian, but I'm begging the Inspector General of Police not to confront civilians because I was trying to avoid a problem. He said, no problem. So, exactly 1.30, TV was on, CNN was on. I was watching CNN, flipping channels, looking at the window, 1.35. The mosque was over, and they started running cars. At that point, I knew it was over. But I kept thinking it would work. In the evening, I was exhausted. I just slept for two weeks, went home. Julia Molly called me. She said she has to see me. So I went back to the hotel. I said, what can I do? She said, look, the plane bringing the stage and the set and the sound and the light at Heathrow Airport, we had, and we had just paid for two Russian jets, those big, uh, the, the biggest cargo planes in the world. It cost us a fortune. We had just paid for them. They were at Heathrow Airport about to load. The crew would not load unless they got war insurance from us. And I said to her, I said, listen, Nigeria is not at war, so I couldn't get war insurance. And I said, if I didn't give them war insurance, they wouldn't load. So now we had two problems. Half the girls, 100 countries, 50 had agreed to leave. 50 were going to leave that day. Now the stage wouldn't come. So maybe we could have done the show with 50 countries instead of 100. But now the stage wouldn't come because they said Nigeria was at war. And at that point, I, I was overwhelmed. I called Mr. President Obasanjo and he said, just cancel the show. It was. Well, what was going through my mind was, you know, almost 20 years of a, in a business trying to put Nigeria on the map. Um, and then realizing that we had lost everything. We lost millions of dollars. How much did you lose? Maybe $10 million. But beyond that, what we lost was worse than that. You're talking of, look. If Nigeria couldn't look after a bunch of 18-year-old girls, it affected foreign, flow of foreign investment for some time. People say, well, look, why would I go and invest in Nigeria if you can look after a bunch of little girls? It, it, was, it was negative all the way. And people don't understand. People don't understand that certain things you do are counterproductive. They hurt you. You know, if you can't look after little girls in a pageant, then they're going to say, well, why am I going to put my money in this country? And, you know, I always look at the big picture. My background is the world. My background is not a city or a state or a country, it's the world. I look at the world, I look at global reactions for every decision I make because the world is a small village. And this little village, and it, people, people, people forget something, like a Lebanese friend said to me, money is a coward. If money goes somewhere, if there's fear, money runs away. Money only goes where there's peace. Money goes to Switzerland, money goes to America, money goes to Germany. You don't see money going to Afghanistan. You don't see money going to Syria. You don't see money going to Iraq. Yes. Money goes to China. Now, if we scare money away, money runs away. And that's what we were doing. We scared money away. And people don't understand little things have a big global impact. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it happened. The president gave his blessing and the show was canceled. I can't even fathom what must have been going through your mind during this time. How did that event affect you? Did it shake your confidence as a businessman? Or did you think that, look, what is going on to this to my country, what, what was going for your well, mind? Well, first of all, many things, many things happened to me. The Western press, they don't like you. Don't be fooled. The Western press is not your friend. They don't see you as smart, intelligent, and successful. They see you as a product. And you have value sometimes. They don't see you as a destination for any major event. They see you maybe. They will hit you hard. Uh, let me give a typical example. When the girls were leaving, a reporter from, 
he was either a reporter or an editor of one of the tabloids in London, saw me at the Hilton Hotel. He said, Mr. Bruce, the girls are leaving now. Uh, can I get a ride on the plane? Because we got to go hire a 747 uh, to take the girls away. So at 12 o'clock at night, they left. I said, look, there's a couple of empty seats. You can go. When the plane left Nigerian territory, he said, ah, it's a British reporter. He said, Miss England, uh, let's toast to, you know, getting out of Nigeria. So they had a toast, champagne, toast. Front page the next day. How this reporter saved Miss England from debt in Nigeria. Front page in England. Now, what is the relationship? I gave him a free ride, yes. and he responded by destroying my country. Yes. yes. Two, why did the Nigerian ambassadors across the world not defend their country? Why was I left alone? Okay, let's say the ambassador hates pageants or hates Ben Bruce, but do you attack, do you destroy the country because you don't like me? Is, is an example that Buhari is president today. Buhari is the president of Nigeria. He is my president. Regardless of what I feel, I must respect him. I must treat him as a president because if I don't value him, nobody will value him. In 2019, we can fight. But right now, he's the president. I want the economy to grow. If I take the position that I want to destroy APC and I want to destroy Nigeria, will there be any Nigeria for me to fix in 2019? So it's a dumb move to destroy your president or destroy somebody you hate and destroy your country in the process. I'll fight Buhari in 2019, but today he's my president. I will support him. So if somebody hated pageants or for religious reasons did not like what I was doing and you ignore Nigeria, you paid a terrible price. That is my biggest regret and that is my biggest lesson. As you recount what you went through on your worst day, I noticed that there's a very strong underlining rhetoric that the government didn't support you, they didn't lend their voice, they didn't, you know, back you or support Nigeria, I guess, in terms of the world stage, because they were all focused on this event. Is that the catalyst that made you think, do you know what? Yes, I am an entertainment powerhouse, but now it's time to become a change maker in politics. Was that the main thing that redirected your path? No, I've, I've always been interested in, and in, I'm an orthodox. I'm, I, I, I like to pride myself in supporting the masses. That is my greatest goal in life, to support the poor. And I, I support them for two reasons. One, for the right reasons, they're poor, they need help, and you have to support them. The second is, if you don't support them, they'll kill you. The rich use the poor to kill the rich. Okay? They kidnap you, they kill you, they maim you. What is the biggest crime in Nigeria today is rape. Babies are being raped. In South Africa, they do it for, for HIV, but this, they're being raped. Okay? We have a serious problem in this country. We have a population explosion. Nobody's paying attention to it. All the tough issues I raise. Population explosion. If you create half a million jobs a year, you say you've done well. You've not done enough because your population is exploding. Every home I go to when I campaign, I see five, six, seven babies with hardly any clothes on, in the creeks, all over the country. People think, thought it was a northern problem. It's a national problem. You have a population explosion. In 100 years or less, Nigeria will be the most populous nation in the world, more populous than China, more populous than India. In a few years' time, we'll be the third most populous nation in the world. Okay, that's dangerous. They say it's a consumer market. Consumer market for what? To buy what? Not Rolls Royce. But consumer market for what? They get involved in voodoo economics. I'm driven to, to fight for the poor. I'm driven to help. I'm driven to make the right change. And I'm driven to, to, to make a difference. Whatever it takes, I'm ready to do it. Because when you've conquered poverty, what else do you want to do when you conquer poverty? Yeah, what, what do you want to do if, you, if you, I've conquered poverty? So, so what else do I need to do in my life? As you get older, you need less. You don't need more. So give back to the people. You have no choice. All the people who steal billions and billions, what are they going to do with it? How can a 60-year-old guy steal five billion or two billion dollars? What is he going to do with it? The name Senator Ben Murray Bruce is one name that is consistently trending online every single week. And that shows that there's a lot of young people that are looking up to you yeah. and some wanting to even follow in your footsteps and be that voice of change. What would be your advice to those young entrepreneurs? I remember. General Zazi, he was the National Security Advisor. 
When he was relieved by President Goodluck Jonathan, he invited me to a function. And he asked me to speak at the function. I started speaking. When I finished, a young person got up and said, let's kill all our leaders. I got scared. No, no, I, I really got scared because I fired them up. And so I, I tried to moderate what I say because I fired up these kids and they, they turned against their leaders. Right. And I don't want that. I don't want any violence. I don't want anybody getting hurt. I don't want to incite the young kids against government. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, kidnapping, Niger Delta problem, Boko Haram, there's nothing religious about all these issues. Every fight we have, by these militants with guns has everything to do with redistribution of wealth. As long as they are poor, they eat once a week, once a day, they'll come get you in any disguise. So Boko Haram has nothing, I repeat, it has nothing to do with religion. It's about economics. They have to have education, they have to have health care, they have to have access to jobs, and they must, and all of Nigeria, must have a means to control our population explosion. As long as we do not control our population explosion, this problem is not going to come to an end. You see them fighting in Mauritius? Why are they fighting here? Thank you for joining us, Senator Ben Murray Bruce. Thank you very on much. my worst day on Forbes Africa TV, you've been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you've heard from the man himself what he had to say, but let's find out what the people closest to him had to say about this man. My name is Yemi Cardoso, Chairman of Citibank Nigeria Limited. My name is Michael Murray Bruce. I'm Ben's older brother. I'm chairman of Davida Stores and I'm also on the board of Silverman Productions. Ben Murray Bruce is... Ben? Uh, I know him to be... Ben is different. He, um, he's one of those people who at a very early age showed that he... if he wanted anything. He made sure he got it. He was never satisfied with anything he had around him. He just wanted things better all the time. And that is why he's foray into um, the entertainment business and the giant strides he made in that business and the way he revolutionized that business didn't come as a surprise to me at all. Well, the one thing about Ben is that each time he fell down, even before his knees touched the ground, he was only up and running, thinking of the next idea. The truth is, those of us who are close to him and around him, we cannot keep up with the pace at which he thinks. He's the sort of person who um, doesn't take no for an answer. I recall times where he had gone into certain lines of business and uh, had problems in taking them to their logical conclusion, but that did not deter him. Um, always with a brand new idea, ready to look at things differently, ready to innovate and to see how he could be ahead of everybody else. A, a trait he had always had, uh, right from the younger days, was his sense of humor and his ability to relate with people, to get the best out of people, to sort of um, bring out um, the lighter side in, in, in people. And I think that is something that has helped him in no small way. From right from uh, university, and we worked closely together in the early days. And um, from then on, his passion switched from entertainment to politics for one reason only. He saw love, he saw a country that was full of hope, yet at the same time appeared to be full of despair. He saw a nation full of wealth, yet there was poverty everywhere. All Ben wants to do is to ensure that the people at the bottom have a better quality of life. That's who he is.
vision. Every successful business leader has it. They live it, breathe it, and embody that ethos in everything they do. However, in the minefield of business, even the most visionary of leaders may have doubt when things go terribly wrong. Those who make it into the history books are the ones with that unique trait, resilience. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV.